Hello, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's webinar. We have taken a short break over the summer and this is the first episode in a brand new series. We're going to be talking about converting historic buildings today and we are going to be bringing you webinars all the way up until early December. So if you enjoyed this one, please do sign up to all the others that are due to come. So for those that might not know me, I know we've got quite a few new faces um, on this webinar today. I'm your host, I'm Eloise, I'm the editor of Boutique Hotel News. So we are an online B2B platform for boutique, lifestyle and luxury hotels. Now, this webinar is sponsored by two of our industry partners, one of which is Cvent, a meetings and event management platform. And here's a short video to show you guys what they're up to. Welcome to the golden age of events, where it's not about how we did things in the past, but about how hospitality and event professionals can come together to build an even stronger event industry. If you're ready to embrace the future of hotel tech, collaborate better with event organizers and reignite your digital marketing, we've got you covered. Join us at Cvent Connect Europe 2022. Further information about Cvent and their event has been popped into the chat if you would like to follow up. Now to run you guys through very briefly, how this webinar itself is going to run. Um, we're going to spend some time at the beginning for some introductions, and then we'll spend 45 minutes in discussion with our trailblazers today. So audience members, if you do have a question for any of our speakers today, please pop these into the chat or use the Q&A function, and I will get round to these at the end. And as a reminder, this webinar is recorded and this recording will be uh, shared with every registrant within 48 hours. A second sponsor for today is Doof. They are a guest experience platform. And once again, we have a short video to highlight what these guys are up to. again further info has been popped into the chat if you would like to follow up. So now I'm going to introduce our trailblazers and just for ease of conversation I'm going to move from left to right as per your slides which means I am kicking off with Justin. Let me hand over to you first. Hey Eloise, thank you so much. Appreciate you um, organizing this all for us today. Uh, yes, so my name is Justin. Uh, CEO and co-founder of Storied Collection. I uh, started my career in, in travel hospitality uh, in the short-term rental space, originally at Airbnb, uh, starting in 2010. Um, stayed there for about 10 or 11 years or so. Um, I'm doing a bit of angel investing in between. Um, and just within the last year, have launched Storied Collection with my co-founders. Uh, looking forward to a successful launch here in the next couple of weeks. Thanks, Justin, and best of luck with the launch. Yes, thank you. Sarah, over to you next, please. Hi, Louise, thank you. Yes, um, I'm Sarah Barlow. I'm an associate of Purcell. And um, Purcell are architects, master planners, and heritage consultants. Um, and as a practice, we have all cover all sectors of work and um, extending the life of old and designing new features with responsive new buildings. So we've worked on a variety of projects where we've converted old buildings into hotels. Um, that includes converting print works, um, educational buildings and country houses as well. And all across the practice we're working on um, all sorts of other exciting projects, 
so including the National Gallery, um, Manchester Town Hall, Harris School, and we're also conservation architects on the Battersea Power Station. Lots of exciting things going on. Brilliant. Thank you, Sarah. And coming to you next, David, please. Hi everyone, um, good to be here this afternoon. Um, I'm an independent heritage and urban design consultant, um, and, but I'm here today because I represent the Institute for Historic Building Conservation. I'm chair of that body and you can read all about us on our, uh, our website, ihbc.org.au. UK. Um, but to say a little bit about my background, I was formerly a planner um, and then moved into conservation quite a number of years ago. I worked for London Borough of Camden and then I spent a large part of my career working for the uh, Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, um, which you, I think today some of you who know inner London will know probably we have some of the most restrictive uh, policies on uh, hotel development that you can imagine because it's so full of hotels but nevertheless that gives me a very good background and can gives me a sort of um, good insight into what might get permission and what might not get permission. Um, in my the rest of my spare time I'm on the Victorian Society's Southern Buildings Committee and I'm on the design review panels of the London boroughs of Enfield and of, uh, of Wandsworth. Um, and just to confirm, despite my Scottish name and Scottish accent, um, all my work and career has actually been in London. So that's where I have most experience. But obviously with my IHBC background, I have a, a wide range of knowledge of um, building conservation throughout the country. Thank you, David. And I know we're going to be talking about planning um, later on in our conversation. And Grace, welcome, Grace, to the webinar. Please, would you like to introduce yourself to our audience? <laughs> Sorry for the uh, uh, late entry. You know, it's fashionably late. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, I, uh, I've been uh, in hotel business for a long time. Uh, I think my specialization uh, has probably come from the fact that um, I've redeveloped um, a number of hotels, uh, uh, either uh, existing hotels um, in uh, Europe or in, um, in the States, even in, in the Caribbean as well. Um, and these tend to be upscale uh, niche market uh, hotels, or if you want to call them boutique hotels, it's not an appellation I particularly care for myself. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, uh, for for this particular subject, um, yeah, very much apropos since uh, and I've been involved in a, a couple of hotels in the UK just uh, currently, and uh, and having also done hotels in France and in you know Portugal and and in all sorts of other places. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Grace. It's Thank you um, to all our speakers actually for, for finding the time uh, to, to speak with us today and very much look forward to hearing all of your insights in just a moment. But before we get on to the main conversation, um, if this is your first time joining this webinar, I always like to offer some context to the, to the discussion that we're about to have. And these are three stories that we have published on Boutique Hotel News this year. And the first two headlines on this slide are um, stories which involve the transformation of old buildings into hotels and the middle story in particular involves the redevelopment of a grade two listed hall into a boutique hotel and I can only imagine that working within listed buildings can be very challenging, but also incredibly rewarding. And no doubt that we are going to be talking about this later on today. But the, the third story in particular um, was published in the early stages of the pandemic. So this was around May 2020 to give you a time frame. And at the time, a, a case was made by Colliers to relax planning restrictions in order for hotels to be redeveloped as alternative use. And I'm going to use this opportunity to actually call on my audience. This is, this is your cue, guys, because if you are somebody at the moment who is working 
with a historical site, I want to know what your experiences are with working within certain planning restrictions. If you had to change something, what would that be? Um, I think this would be really beneficial to the conversation that we're going to have. And I'll just read out everyone's feedback um, and, and experiences as and when these come through. But on the second slide, I would like to draw your attention to the bottom left-hand story. Now, this is an article. It's published by uh, another uh, media source, and it poses the question, is now the right time to build a hotel? And within the article, it notes things uh, such as um, increases in construction costs and interest rates, supply chain issues, uh, the, the, the challenges to secure debt financing. These are all factors that are making it very difficult to build a hotel at the moment, but not altogether unachievable. And I know that these challenges are also being faced by owners and developers of historical sites because the very nature of these buildings are complex and they are costly. And we are going to be diving into all of this pretty much right now. We are ready to discuss converting historic buildings. And I'm gonna kick off with a question to David, please. Let's say there's an owner in our audience right now who is either embarking on, um, they have a historical site or an historical building and they're thinking about converting it. What should they take into account when they are considering conversion? Okay, thanks, Eloise. Um, I think I should start that one off by going maybe one step behind your question, really, <laughs> and saying before you buy a site, um, you should be very careful looking at it um, and analysing what's there and what the planning restrictions might be. Um, there would be lots of sites you might buy that are just not at all um, appropriate for conversion to hotel use. And the reason I brought that up was, I say my background in Kensington, Chelsea was, um, and this is partly backed up by um, national planning policy as well, is to retain and increase resident, permanent residential accommodation. So if perhaps somebody is buying a site that might be in current residential use, certainly in most of our urban areas and would like to change it to hotel, it will be a planning uphill battle really just on that, um, that big policy issue about changing its use from residential to, uh, to hotel use. So I thought I better say that right at the beginning because it is something mm. when um, people can come to grief. I mean, even purchasing, let's say something that might have been a historic building in a care, that was a care home or something similar. Again, that counts as permanent residential accommodation. So difficult to get that change of use. So that's the big sort of policy issue that I know very well from my background. Going out of London, maybe that's maybe not so bad if you have a, let's say, um, a mansion and grounds that might be convertible. The local authority, and that's the other thing, is looking at national planning policy, local authority policy as well. Might they be um, more flexible on allowing a change of a change of use? But getting back to the um, fundamentally what your your basic question about what are what are the issues involved? I'll start off with. Um, Actually, I'll call them the, the, the bigger sort of planning issues. And I'm sure Sarah will be saying a lot more about the detail of how you, know, you actually go about converting properties. But the sort of issues that the planning authority might look at. So let's say we've got a, a, use, a building that's not um, residential. And of course, that could be anything. It could be a, a redundant mill. It could be a hosp ex-hospital, warehouses, um, and even, I think, you'll probably know about um, the most unusual one I've come across in the UK is um, the prison at, um, in Oxford that was converted to hotel use a number of years ago. So it just shows you um, with the right will and uh, the right uh, compromises, then a lot of different buildings can be converted to hotel use. But um, getting back to what local authorities making, I mean, I should say that in terms of um, 
process, the number one thing is ask, applying for planning permission. And if the building is listed, you would need to apply for listed building consent at the same time to do the alterations. But the, the local authority is going to be looking, first of all, at issues like um, the traffic generation that might be come from um, the new use. It might be totally different to what was there before. Um, it will be looking at any extensions that are proposed, the design of those extensions, the physical mass of those extensions that isn't affecting amenity of adjoining properties. And a lot of it is to do with local amenity, assuming there's residential and other people living round about. They'll be looking very carefully about how that change might affect um, local residents round about. So that's on the sort of, plan, I'll say the planning sort of side of things. But of course, a large part is to do with actually the, um, the physical nature and character of the historic building and whether it lends itself to hotel use. And as I've said, lots of different buildings certainly can be reused. But um, the sort of thing that um, a local authority might be looking at is, first of all, the state of disrepair that the building's in. That does, does have a, a bearing on how flexible it might be. But I should say there's a real caveat on that is that if you read um, government policy on that, an owner who has deliberately neglected a, a building to try and get a more uh, radical reuse, that will certainly not be looked on favourably. So bear, bear that in mind. But let's say um, an owner, a new owner has a, acquired a building that is in serious disrepair. Well, that might allow a little bit more flexibility on the, on the reuse of it. But so with that caveat that I've said, already. Mm -hmm. um, and then we get, go to get into all the um, issues around the, the conversion itself. A lot actually seems to, from my experience on lots of conversion of buildings, is, is very much to do with getting your own suite facilities in, because you'll have facilities and you'll have an existing layout of buildings and that, that might not lend themselves to uh, putting on suite facilities in. Of course, that's going to be major um, you know, intervention in the building itself. Um, so that's quite clearly um, might be one of the major issues. Um, providing just um, services, all the services that are necessary, whether it be those that are electronic, digital, everything else that's required is going to be a big uh, issue. And I, I don't want to um, go too much on what Sarah might be saying, but I'll just sort of list them basically the ones that I, I see. That one, um, that yes, providing services, en suites, means of escape in case of fire is a, obviously a big issue in any building as well. Um, and accessibility, you know, getting proper accessibility, um, level access for those um, with mobility problems. And that includes, of course, lift access into the, the upper floors as well. Um, but if, so those are probably the main issues. But um, just as I think sort of background in terms of, well, how do we consider those issues? There's a lot of things to be balanced up there. Um, the local authority will certainly be looking at and would be expecting any professionals who are working on behalf of a, of a new owner of the, of the building to um, analyze that building in terms of its historical significance to, be, to begin with. There's a very, there are lots of publications on this. So the sort of starting point and Sarah may say more about this as well, is looking at the significance of the building historically in terms of how it has developed its design, how important its design is, its layout, how that layout may have changed over the, mm -hmm. the years. There may be various phases of development over a long period of time. So that's a real sort of starting point. And then the challenge will then be balancing that significance of the building with any alterations that might be proposed. So just, that's probably it in a nutshell without being yeah. uh, too uh, too specific on things. I think yeah. to add to that, David, that was all really helpful. But um, yeah, so you mentioned that there, are, there might be different types of buildings that are being converted and whether that building suited. So there's generally two different types of buildings, aren't there? So one that was built as something completely different, like a warehouse or a prison, and, and how you go, you think about how you go about keeping the spirit of that place. And then there might be the, the other option that's the, the big country houses that were actually originally built for reception and entertaining in mind. So that might already have that kind of form of progression of spaces through from reception rooms to private bedrooms. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's thinking about those two different types of, types of building. 
Mm -hmm. Yes, so if I could ju just add into that, um, just one of the more interesting ones is to, to look at, if you haven't seen now from quite a number of years ago, was the um, St Pancras Hotel um, mm -hmm. at the station, which was a hotel originally, but of course it was a Victorian hotel with basically lack of all the facilities that we might expect now. And that was very cleverly, I mean, expensively, but very cleverly um, adapted for, uh, for current hotel use. Mm -hmm. We've already had um, a comment from one of our audience members. Hi, Serena, nice mm -hmm. to hear from you. Um, Serena's experience um, with a period property in Westminster is that planning restrictions conflict with changes that we want to make as we work on our sustainability agenda. And Serena, you'd be pleased to know that I have some sustainability oriented questions uh, ready to ask our panelists later on, but I'd like to move the conversation on to talk about the actual steps of converting um, an older site into a hotel, which brings me on to Sarah. I mean, what are those key steps in converting a historical site into a new hotel? Yeah, so from an architectural perspective, um, so the way we'd approach converting a historical building into a hotel would be, as David mentioned, to first understand the building's history and what makes it unique. So it's changes of use through time and really understanding the spirit of that place. And then secondly, assessing that significance of the building in its various parts. So using that historical research to understand um, the significance of all of the parts of the building. And from this, we've then identified those opportunities for change. So if we form an understanding of the kind of lower significance areas, um, whether this might be from a potential level of intervention in the past um, through its various uses and changes over time. Mm -hmm. um, and alongside this, we want to be understanding the brief. So what's needed by the hotel and with the client, what's the, what's the hotel's unique angle? So, are they doing kind of dining, spa, weddings? Um, and then bringing that research all together. So where are the functions best suited spatially within the context of the historic building? So thinking about those adjacencies, what rooms are best alongside each other and what works with, within that historical building? Um, and are there any possible needs for new building additions and working within that kind of opportunities for change that we set out at the beginning? And then lastly, we just really need to remember to consider to reinstate the key qualities of the historical building. So working with those qualities to deliver the experience of the, the building and the hotel, and which is ultimately what brings people in and keeps them coming back. What's that key experience? Mm -hmm. There's definitely um, a, a great storytelling narrative within historical sites that, that suit the boutique lifestyle luxury hotel conversions. Uh, David, you referenced the, the, the prison in Oxford, which is now a Malmaison hotel. Um, there's, there's the Nomad in London, which I think was also a, a prison, if I'm not, or was it a police mm -hmm. headquarters or something along those? That's now the Nomad, mm -hmm. um, which is probably one Pol of the big, yeah. biggest police, London. Police it station, police. I think it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's also the Great Scotland Yard that's just recently opened up. So. They, they do naturally lend themselves very well within the, the, the hotel space. Justin, I know you work with or, or are partnering with a lot of different historical hotels and, and have been speaking to a lot of owners. What are their biggest pain points for owners of these historical hotels? Yeah, so um, kind of building on the, the last point there with the, the rich history of these properties, right, is something that, that story collection is, is definitely anchoring to or where we, you know, as we talk to these owners and visited these properties, we realized that they're going back as these sort of former residences now turned accommodations um, have a story to tell, right? And so that's sort of what uh, what our company is is focusing on and, and connecting the properties themselves with with the travelers looking to, to you know, revisit their their former heritage. Um, so some of the pain points that we've been hearing from uh, the owners themselves, and now understand a lot of the, the conversation we have are, are properties that have already been converted, right, from historical properties into, into hotel accommodations. Um, I think across the board, we're, we're hearing um, staffing, right, is, is a major thing, right, finding people, warm bodies to, to ultimately, you know, do the work on property, as well as just the 
the massive operational costs and time that that's required for these properties. You're talking massive buildings, you know, sometimes over a hundred rooms um, on, you know, large plots of land um, where, you know, the upkeep itself can be immense, mm -hmm. right? And you start talking about the, the grounds, the gardens, um, and, and not to mention all the, the compliance required to, to maintain that, that graded status and that, um, that goes into these, these type of historic residences. And so even if they were looking to upgrade uh, the property, oftentimes they're hamstrung just financially, right? Because of, of uh, the operational overhead costs that are required to, to maintain the property. And so it, it's almost uh, cash in cash out kind of situation for them which um which can be difficult if they are looking to uh to renovate or to upgrade in any way mm -hmm. thanks justin grace i'd like to bring you into the conversation here because under the you've you've just recently within the last year or so launched a new brand which is the the relay retreats um and if i'm not mistaken that the first site was a conversion of a an old in yeah. unless, unless I'm completely mistaken I'd like to, I'd like to hear whether what Justin's just described does that tally with your experience of, of converting a historical site and what were the challenges that, that you faced um I I think you know I agree with most of the the points that have been uh, brought up by my co-panelists um they all have very valid points and uh what I what I learned is really um, since I worked on the first hotel, the one that you're making a reference to, Eloise, is, is actually um, a 600-year-old uh, coaching inn um, in Henley-on-Thames. Um, the hotel was called the Red Lion uh, Hotel, of course, you know, one of, you know, 550 in this country. Um, and therefore, it was something that uh, was definitely on my mind is to, you know, for the rebranding, repositioning that I was going to change but nevertheless it is called the red lion and there's a red line on top of the roof <laughs> <laughs> so uh not to be missed um so yes was it um a challenging process uh you know and this is not a conversion this is already a hotel uh mm -hmm. with a lot of history uh but nevertheless um the fact that it hasn't been touched on for probably 30 years, except for very cosmetic things that were done within the building. Mm -hmm. um, but those things have really sort of gone from uh, shabby chic to not shabby, you know, just shabby altogether. Uh, <laughs> and just, you know, need it to be uh, completely, you know, uh, stripped out and, um, you know, done new. Um, so, um, you know, I think both David and Sarah, and, you know, and as well as Justin have explained a little bit about the technical process. So maybe I should just share my experience of, you know, some of the challenges I came across. Um, so, so one of them is certainly um, when you take on something like that in a very sort of a town like Henley on Thames, where the residents feel uh, very proud of their town. Um, you know, they own the hotel. I don't own the hotel. They own the hotel. So uh, public opinion accounts very much. Um, so that is the first thing to do is, you know, you have to get a buy-in from them. You have to get their support. Otherwise, you know, you, mm. you, it's a non-starter. Um, in this particular case, the residents were all excited and supportive because the hotel has been left a really, you know, in a state of dilapidation and and it was an eyesore because, you know, people would just stop going there and, um, and uh, it, it was really a shame. So, so I did, you know, when I was in town, you know, I did cross people. It was during COVID lockdowns uh, and they would tell me, you know, good on you, you know, welcome to the town. You know, we're really happy that, and, you know, that you're doing something about it. Um, so I think that's the first thing. Public perception and opinion in the local mm -hmm. community is very important. Um, and what's important is also, you know, that my intentions was to continue to operate as a hotel because other people, buyers have looked at the hotel and they wanted to turn it into, um, you know, uh, either residential uh, mm -hmm. block or a care home, both of which were, you know, extremely 
um, you know, made every, everyone in, the, in town very, very upset. So uh, this is a case in point why they were also supportive of me. Then the other um, challenge I, I went <laughs> is, I would say is, is go by the book. Okay, don't try to, to do things, you know, sort of uh, without having checked with your heritage consultant and your advisor, et cetera. So, so what I did a bit in haste, and it's a little anecdote to share with you, um, you know, we followed everything by the book, but at some point um, we had stripped out the inside and uh, the demolition crew said, Okay, Grace, we have the, you know, we have the scaffolding. You know, shall we take down the signs? I said, go for it, take down the signs. So we took down the signs. And next moment I had, you know, the Henley Herald, you know, publishing a front page. <laughs> Grace has taken down the sign of the red lion, you know. Oh my God, I was sent a note whereby I was going to be thrown into prison for having done that. Uh, so I wouldn't, you know, sort of encourage any of you or your clients to try something like that because there was a nervous moment. Anyway, uh, we fell back uh, in line with uh, the planners. So always go with your planners um, <laughs> and <laughs> make sure you're following the rules. Um, the other thing I would say is, um, you know, get familiar with your local counselors, you know, uh, make sure again, you know, the mayor of the town, that they're very in tune with what you're trying to do and that they also are there to help you because it's all being part of the insertion into town. Now, um, challenges on, at Henley, I would say, um, you know, it was a question of finding a building team because I, I did that whole, whole refurbishment, um, you know, between two, two COVID lockdowns. And so it was, you know, some people thought I was, you know, crazy, but, you know, others thought I was brave, but somewhere in between. Um, but it's all the points that you've uh, already raised, you know, um, how do you find, a, you know, a reliable general contractor, you know, that would deliver quality workmanship, you know, building supplies, you know, they were already running short at the time and um, with escalating cost. Um, and then, uh, and more recently, you know, it's not even finished. Uh, I'm doing a second hotel uh, at a place called Kuden Beach, which is in the town of Bexhill on Sea. Uh, for those of you who don't know where it is, it's actually on the East Sussex coast. Um, there, my experience post COVID and post Brexit has been much tougher. Um, it's not a listed building. Thought, I thought, wow, you know, you know, it's only 1920s building, you know, this is mm. going to be very easy. Well, it wasn't. And for different reasons, you know, this time it's because the project, um, uh, you know, the, how would you say, you know, the, the, the people that were involved, the builders, you know, mm. uh, were probably not up to, up to scratch. So, um, yeah, so some of these, are, some of these are the challenges. And I would say one glaring one is that if you want it, uh, if you're thinking about um, taking up such a such a type of project, you know whatever your cost is, be prepared that it's going to go up. <laughs> <laughs> this, I was actually at a. I hosted um, an in-person event this morning. Um, in London and, and at this event was um, a, a hotel developer who was opening his first hotel, new build hotel in London. And um, it's about, um, I think he either said six, six months away from, from being finished. And, and these challenges that you've talked about, albeit a new build um, around sort of rising construction costs, finding the labor, it's being felt also in, in urban centers too. Um, and I'd like to move the conversation on to talk about these these rising costs. So coming back to you, Justin, you know, having spoken with lots of hotel owners over the past year or so, particularly now, how are they managing rising energy costs and what impact is this having on their capital expenditure? It's been alluded to that these properties are pretty costly and, and expensive to run. Um, even yes, yeah. the development side is sounds pretty expensive. Right, yes, and um, expensive to, to keep warm, right, as well mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day. So um, 
so no, we've, we've, um, you know, I, I think everyone's trying to sort of, you know, weather the storm and, and sort of make ends meet through this, this current situation that we're in. Um, you know, I, I've spoken with some owner operators that, you know, through the development, right, were thoughtful about, you know, doing things in a sustainable way, um, which is paying dividends now, right? But for, for so many of these properties, um, you know, the, 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 the property itself is, is just, you know, very antiquated in terms of um, any type of sustainability or any type of, um, of things that will, will help it kind of run more efficiently. So in the worst case, I've heard some of these properties are even considering sort of shutting down for the winter months, right? When, when things are a bit slower and, you know, they might be off in the, the Scottish Highlands, right? For instance, where, you know, the, the guests might not be coming as frequently and, and for them to, to keep the, the head count, to keep the staff, to keep everything up and running, it just doesn't actually make sense financially to do that. So that's, I think, probably the, the, the kind of furthest end of, of the spectrum there. Um, but, you know, I think everyone's just kind of hoping and, and waiting and, and trying to see if, if energy costs will go down eventually, because I think that's just a, a massive, uh, a massive pain point for, for so many people, not only in, in hotel industry, right, but, you know, across the world. So mm -hmm. I am, um, I know, at least in the UK, there's a, a, a mini budget, I believe, that's be, being announced this Friday. Um, and we're going to be at least on, on BHN looking at what are those um, if any loans, grants, incentives that the government is going to offer just hotels generally at the moment to, to help ease the, the pressures of these, these rising costs. But it's, it begged a question, um, with, with the energy crisis that, that's happening at the moment, whether it is going to spur or prompt the transition to more sustainable operations. So looking at the sort of the, the tools, the technology, um, the infrastructure that hotels are going to build into their systems in order for them to be more economically viable down the line, which brings me on to the next point. And I'd like to bring uh, Sarah into the conversation here. Serena alluded to it earlier that she's, um, she's struggling with balancing the, the planning restrictions against her own sustainability agenda. But as an architect, Sarah, what challenges, challenges do you face um, when implementing sustainable systems in older buildings? Um, yeah, I mean, well, the, the concept of simply reusing an existing building in itself is inherently sustainable. So keeping that embodied carbon of construction down um, because the greenest and the cheapest energy is the energy you don't use. Um, but when we think about how to implement sustainable measures, we need to think about the building as a whole system, so a whole building approach, and come from it from the perspective of firstly um, reducing the energy consumption before thinking about the systems themselves. So in terms of reducing the consumption, we can think about the building envelope. So can we eliminate the unnecessary energy use by addressing defects like damp drafts and cold bridges? And then can we improve the performance of the building fabric? So through insulation or solar shading. And then also at the same time as that, thinking about how we can reduce energy consumption through occupant behavior. So hotels are terrible at using huge amounts of water in the running. And how can we put measures into place to reduce this? Um, and once we've reduced the energy consumption, we can only then really consider what active sustainable measures we can put in place. So can we degas the whole scheme through electric systems and are there opportunities for zero carbon technologies, so PVs and heat panels, or how can we put these in place? And then linking back in, as you said, into the business case, because this is at the forefront of people's minds with the rising energy prices. Um, the, yeah, these adaptations will basically are needed to give long-term security. Um, if we're doing a large-scale refurbishment and we're not considering this as part of the brief, we're missing an important opportunity. Um, the legislation is moving in that direction um, of needing to do it in the future. So we need to do it now, really. If we can't buy a gas boiler after 2025 and we've already put the system in place for that, then it, yeah, it's, it's not going to work. Um, 
and from a it can be a business opportunity too so thinking about it on the flip side and at one of our projects uh we're working with the client to offer a kind of net zero wedding package um so there is a market for it it's a good selling point that people are wanting to buy into that and have a more eco-friendly um impact on, on the environment and um it might be a good way for businesses who are finding it harder to justify these costs of adaptation kind of weaving the sustainability into that business plan from the outset what are the um the cost implications of those green decisions early mm. on um in in a project and then how does that help the, the sort of end goal yeah i mean it, obviously it, you need to balance up against what what you're going to spend on on the refurbishment but if we're already considering a large scale refurbishment of the building then we really need to think about how we can reduce the energy consumption and integrate these active measures to then reduce costs in future and you can absolutely have um have a look at you know paybacks like how long that's going to take, take to pay back but if it's also integrating into legislation as well um then we need to be yeah doing these measures putting these measures in place now really mm -hmm. on on the um legislation point david I'd, I'd like to to bring you in here um could you share an overview of what the current guidance is on on retrofitting traditional buildings and and with a view as to how you expect this is going to change in the future sarah's just alluded to the fact that it, it, it's changing it's inevitable it's going to happen but what does that look like yeah. um yeah i think Yes, in terms of the, the last question, what is going to be in the future, I think it's a, a rapidly changing field, actually, in, in the whole um, anything to do with climate change and retrofit. So I'd probably be foolish if I tried to predict too much on that. But I can say something about what the situation is now and currently what's happening. And um, But first of all, you have to agree entirely with what Sarah said about that stage by stage approach. I think where people go wrong is they have a sort of fixed idea of, oh, I would like this in terms of my energy efficient building, rather than going back to the building and looking at what the building has and what its faults are and where it might where it might lead you in terms of what you can, can do. And um, it was actually a point I meant to make earlier on, um, but didn't. And I think it came through what Grace has said as well. Key to this is employing the right professionals to do it. And uh, of course, I would say that as somebody who's a, a heritage expert, but if you were um, if you were uh, employing a lead professional like a firm of architects like Purcell, for example, I don't mind uh, giving them an, an advertisement at this, at this point, it, that does help very much in terms of how you're going to deal with your historic building through energy efficient retrofitting, anything else as well, just uh, is employ the right professionals. And I should say, bring that back to retrofitting, there are quite a few, shall we say, cowboys in the in the operating at the moment who are trying to sell basically a product which might be fine for some buildings but is not necessarily good for historic buildings so again it's that understanding what's important about the building and getting the right people with the right experience but if i get to the sort of um details of where the advice currently lies um it's difficult actually with non-residential buildings but there's lots of advice on residential buildings at the moment in terms of what's provided. Now, I'll give you three documents, um, one for England from Historic England, and it's, uh, if anybody wants to note it down, Historic Environment Advice Note 16, so for short, H-E-N 16. Anyway, its title is Energy Efficiency in Traditional Homes. Um, but a lot of the advice in that for traditional homes would apply to hotels. Obviously, there are differences, but um, much of it would be would be sound for that. Um, in Wales, there's something called uh, How to Improve Energy Efficiency in Historic Buildings. Um, that's published by CADU, who are the, the Welsh government organisation in, in charge of policy. And in Scotland, it's... Uh, Historic Environment Scotland have a guide to energy retrofit of traditional buildings. So everybody's doing, shall we say, slightly different things, but that's not unsurprising because climate in Scotland is quite different to the climate in the south of England, So as we know. So it's not surprising that you get slightly different advice from different authorities. So that advice 
is out there at the moment, um, but it is changing and, and being looked to be revised all the time. In fact, going on this week, there's a government holding various round tables with various organisations about um, climate change and um, improving energy efficient in homes, specifically, again, residential rather than other uses. But that, that, that um, discussion is going on at the moment. So whether that leads to new ed, um, new measures, either through building regulations or in terms of planning and historic buildings, we've yet to see. But the, that's the sort of current guidance as it is at the moment. And if I can just add one other it's an organisation who your members might be interested in looking at. It's called the Sustainable Traditional Buildings Alliance, STBA for short. They do a lot of studies into how um, buildings might be um, retrofitted without um, adversely affecting their historic character. They have a very good website and there's a lot of guidance on that. And they promote, as Sarah said, actually, the whole house approach. Basically, it's not just looking at oh, here's one problem, let's solve it, because that can lead you to other problems. So it's um, a very complicated area, actually, as, as we go on. But the advice is out there, and it will be changing. I'm not quite sure how it will change, as I, I don't have that sort of <laughs> crystal ball in front of me at the moment. <laughs> no, thanks, David. Thanks for, for, for pointing us in, in the right direction. I'd like to come back to Justin for my next question. Um, we've talked about retrofitting or, or adding in the right the right tools or um, looking to just upgrade or, or refurbish said property so to help owners secure the financing that they need in order to execute on that can you give us a sense of what investors are looking for yeah so i think it you kind of have a, a, a sort of spectrum of investors, right? On one end, you have the institutional type, you know, private equity that have very strict mandates in terms of the, the type of properties that fit their sort of investment thesis, right? Whether it's the number of, of rooms that the property has or the distance it is from a sort of city center or something like that, right? All the way to the other end of you know, an individual that might find a, a former family home or a property, right, that just sort of speaks to them and, and want to kind of undertake this labor of love um, in the renovation process and, and sort of everything in between as well. Um, I think what the, you know, across the board, what they're looking for is, is a property that has the opportunity to be improved, right, and to, through these upgrades, drive a higher ADR, a higher occupancy, right? Um, perhaps there's, you know, a, a restaurant facility that might be underused or something like that can, that can drive um, massive amounts of additional revenue. At, at Story Collection, we've sort of seen this gap speaking to the owner operators uh, and our hotel partners and, and are toying with the idea of potentially launching a sort of in the vein of a key money kind of concept, right? That, that um, investors will provide as part of a deal to, to you know, ultimately help upgrade a property that they're investing in. Um, we're seeing the opportunity to perhaps do something more along the lines of a, a sort of heritage rejuvenation fund, um, mm -hmm. you know, going back to the, the first point, right? Where these owners are, are often cash strapped um, and give them a way to, to sort of influx some capital, let them hire, the right advisors, the right architects, right? And, and perhaps do things in a sustainable way uh, that'll ultimately help their business flourish. So I think that's kind of a, a pretty high level of, of kind of what the, uh, the investment environment looks like now. Mm -hmm. and, and why do you think that now would be the right time to invest in your historical building site property? Yeah, well, you know, part of the reason why we launched Storied Collection too is, is because we're seeing this, this massive trend of, of people looking to sort of revisit their ancestral home, their, their these heritage properties and, and, and kind of bring that tie back to their former family or their, their former residence. Um, and so I think this is a trend that's prevailing sort of across travel, right? And it started mm -hmm. with, um, you know, Airbnb and, and letting people know that there were different types of properties, right? You don't yeah. still have to stay in, in the city center at the, the, the big brand hotel, that there's these you know, very interesting properties and, and allow you to really experience things in a different way, right? And I think that's the traveler of today is, is looking for that as well. 
Um, and so these properties, you know, of course, offer the uh, the opportunity to to experience this past, this history, um, and and hopefully kind of take something back with them after that trip. Thank you, thank you, Justin. And I'd like to um, end our conversation with um, with Grace, actually, um, because I've, I've mentioned earlier that, that you're rolling out the Relay Retreats brand. Um, you've got one in Henley, you're about to open in Cooden Beach. So what is it that you look for in a prospective uh, site? Do you have a preference for, for converting? Are you more interested in new builds? You know, as, a, as someone who's, I would say you're know, not new to the game, but on a on a journey. What is it that you're looking for? Um, I agree with a number of points that you know Justin has made. You know concerning the attitude or the approach um, of an investor operator, which is in, in this particular case uh, uh, where I am. Um, the Relay Retreats is a, is a new brand that we're developing and um, uh, the commonality of it is uh, that we want to be waterside. So this is something mm -hmm. just a little bit more unique. Um, uh, we were able to acquire the Hotel Henley um, because it's sitting right in front of the Thames and you know, uh, with rooms that have views over uh, the river. And in the case of Kuden Beach, I mean, we're literally on the beach um, and we own the beach up until the high tide line, which is extremely rare in England. Um, so um, these are two uh, types of properties that, that, that we've been able to, to acquire within the last um, you know, two years. But in terms of criteria for search, uh, very much similar to what Justin has mentioned, strategic street address, preferably walking distance to the town, uh, an attractive building with mm -hmm. authentic architecture and characteristics, a minimum of bedrooms to make the business viable. So for me, 40 would be good. Mm -hmm. uh, the potential of creating value because, you know, what am I looking for? Maybe some additional bedrooms. If I don't have my minimum of 40, I would like to be able to get to it. So in the case of Cooden Beach, we bought it. There's 40 bedrooms and well, we have the opportunity to convert an unused tavern uh, mm -hmm. into five additional, what we call veranda rooms. So basically there's a patio in front of each room. So that's a real plus in terms of um, creation of value. Um, and then, uh, yeah, they're all, you know, water facing, as I've mentioned, preferences. Um, you asked, uh, I say without hesitation, I would prefer a conversion uh, if we're talking about old Europe or in the UK, because, you know, not, nothing for you to uh, learn, but, you know, most of the best commercial buildings are anyway in the, in, in the center of town, and they're the ones that you can't pull down. Yeah. <laughs> so you recycle them, right? You buy them, you renovate them, you recycle them. And, and that's really a philosophy. And some people don't like that. Uh, I love it because I'm passionate about, you know, architecture. I like existing buildings that have a history and charm. And, but it's important for me to get good vibes once I go inside the building the first time. Um, if the house spirits do not like me, repel me or spook me well that's <laughs> a clear case of abandon right from the start um and then last but not least um i like conversions or just recycling an, an old hotel because there's a framework and within that framework you know i could um be creative you know i could you know change from the restaurant into you know, a, um, um, a great big salon living room, which we did at uh, Henley. So the old dining room has now become the palm court. Um, and it feels like that. Um, and then we pushed the restaurant you know, towards the courtyard. Uh, and the courtyard used to be a parking lot. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do, you know, to, to fulfill your own sort of... Um, uh, requirements and uh, desires 
And I think you can do a lot within you know, existing buildings. Mm -hmm. You could argue here that, that working within the, the constraints of a building actually propels you to become more creative in that it's, it's, it's more of a challenge to think quite cleverly about how you engineer certain rooms. I think Sarah mentioned it earlier about, you know, what, what, can, what is viable within said four walls of, of the building. So what a positive note to end on. Um, I'm going to wrap up the conversation today. So thank you, David, Sarah, Justin, and Grace for your insights thus far. I just have a couple of closing slides that I would like to run our audience through briefly before we close off today. The first of which is, a webinar, my next webinar that I am hosting on September the 26th, it was talked about today, we are um, going to be exploring how to recruit overseas talent and how do you navigate immigration rules and this is being held in association with Hotel Solutions Partnership. And that link to register for the webinar has been popped into the chat, it would be fantastic to see you all there. And if you would like to hear further information about working with us across our webinars or our podcasts or anything to do with the Boutique Hotel News website, please get in touch with my colleague Katie. Her details are up on your screens now. And all that is left for me to do to say is say thank you. I've, I've thanked my speakers. Um, thank you to our sponsors, Sivan and Duv. And I would also like to thank our audience for sticking with us right to the very end, your true troopers here. Um, for our audience members, um, we're going to leave this webinar open for an extra two minutes so that um, you can follow up on all the links that we have popped into the chat. Um, speakers, if you need to drop off, <laughs> you can, I will not be offended. But otherwise, thank you all once again for tuning in. Do take care of yourselves and I will see you next Monday on September the 26th. Goodbye, folks. <laughs>